All right, good morning everybody and welcome to another ePrime live stream. My name is Devin Struthers. I am the, um, I'm the support coordinator for Psychology Software Tools and today we have a really cool topic to talk about. So the name of the video of today is Auditing ePrime and I want to talk a little bit about what that means. Uh, a lot of our promotional materials, a lot of the things we really brag about with ePrime is that it is millisecond accurate. Um, and I want to talk about what that means and more importantly I want to talk about how we test that. So the point of today's webinar or live stream is we're going to be talking about how exactly we claim millisecond accuracy in ePrime and the tests we do to ensure that our devices are millisecond accurate as well as, as, well as any devices that we might be working with. So today what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be walking through making a timing test for response devices. Um, and I have a couple of devices over here to show you guys um, for our response devices. We're also going to be talking through a sound timing sample. So we're going to be figuring out how to determine sound onset latency in your particular setup. This might be pretty important for some people who are doing sound, time par or sound type paradigms. Uh, and then finally we're going to be doing some display tests. And I'll be showing you guys how to make a very simple display test using Kronos. Um, Kronos is going to be featured pretty heavily today, but we do have some uh, ways around Kronos too if you need. Um, but generally speaking, it is a really useful tool if you don't have a parallel port built into your computer. Uh, and that's going to kind of be the caveat today. Is obviously on this you know laptop that I'm streaming from, I don't have a parallel port and I don't have an expansion slot to put a PCIe card, so Kronos in this case is extremely necessary in accomplishing this. So the first thing I want to talk about today is the hardware that we have. Um, in order to do our timing tests, we actually have a two computer setup. The first computer, you can see right here, this is just our computer that's running ePrime. Um, this is what the timing is going to be from, um, and we're going to be timing or testing the timing of ePrime on this computer in particular. In this case, it's just the laptop I do my live streams. Now I'm going to flick over to another camera quick and I'll show you the second computer in our two computer setup. There we go. So as you can see there, we have um, we have our other computer with our black box toolkit software set up and ready to receive data. And then if you take a look at the bottom part of that, there's that black box toolkit um, hardware console. Now what we're going to be doing is we're going to be sending signals from ePrime over to the black box toolkit hardware console. Um, now what that's going to do is that's going to make sure that all of the timing that we say is actually verified by third-party hardware and software. And the way that that verification happens is going to depend entirely on the type of test that we're doing. So today we're going to start with just a very simple timing test for our response devices. I'm trying to make this as simple as possible, so if you'd like to see the onset latency or the response latency in any of your response devices, you can uh, mirror these tests at home. And a couple of these come with a little caveats too, and I'll make sure to, to mention those as we go. So now that we have both of our computers set up, we have our black box toolkit that's going to be controlling the main timing of all of our experiments. We need the actual hardware we're going to be doing our responses with. Now the easiest one in this case is going to be Kronos. Kronos is what's going to be sending the signals out, and I'll show you how to do that. But Kronos is also going to be the device that we're testing the timing of. So we're going to basically simulate a key press of a Kronos. The Kronos device, all we need in this case is the I.O. expander. Um, and that's just something that you can purchase additionally with Kronos. It goes into the back of Kronos, and I'll show you that really quickly. But it's just something that you can use in order to um, just demonstrate how Kronos, or send signals to Kronos, and then uh, simulate button presses. Now, if you're using a keyboard or mouse and would like to get the timing of that, and would like to determine what the timing is in relation to a key press, so what's the delay between when I press a key and whenever ePrime registers that key, that's also a very easy tune. I'll show you what we have. So the first thing I'm going to show you is our mouse. So it's a little modified. Give me one second here. There we go. So it's just a little bit modified. So pretty standard mouse, but what we actually have is we opened the mouse up earlier and we actually put these wires into it. Now what these wires are going to do is, especially this end of the little gator clip here, um, Black Box Toolkit is actually going to send a signal from itself into this mouse and it's actually wired on the inside of this mouse. I can't really open it up right now. But um, it's actually wired into button one on this mouse. So what it's going to do is it's going to send five volts of electricity 
from Black, from black Box Toolkit, which will be on this end of it, into the mouse itself, and it's going to simulate a button press. And what this is going to do is it's going to tell us what the latency on this mouse is, so what the response latency is. Uh, and I have some data files to show you what that's going to look like too then. So that's the hardware portion for the mouse. We also have a keyboard over here. And the keyboard's very, very similar. So the way the keyboard is set up is we've also done very similar wiring. So just a standard keyboard, but we've managed to get a wire inside it. And the wire is actually, in this case, it's uh, wired to the X key, as you can see here. It's wired to the X key. And if you send five volts of electricity from Black Box Toolkit into here, it actually simulates a button press on the X key of the keyboard. So that's a way that we're gonna simulate the button press going from Black Box Toolkit to the keyboard itself. And the reason that we're simulating these button presses and I'm not actually pressing the button is because we want to get rid of any error that might happen with me. I want this entire process to be automated. I want Black Box Toolkit to handle all of the timing because I don't necessarily want E-Prime to timing test itself and I don't want to have to sit there and press the button because there might be delays in me pressing the button. So this makes sure that your response timing is consistent. Um, the only other device we have then, aside from the Kronos, the keyboard, and the mouse, is we have an SR box. And I'm going to show you what we've done to this SR box. This is something that PST makes. Um, so this is just a standard serial response box. Um, and if you notice, there are four little screws there, there, and then on the back here, there and there. If you open those up, you can actually open up the SR box itself like that. Now remember to be very careful if you ever do this. We actually don't really recommend opening it up like this unless you're doing something very specific because the components inside are very fragile. So if you end up bumping any of the components of the SR box while you're doing this, that might actually void the warranty if you, you know, are a little rough with the components inside. But if you look inside this SR box, and I'll show you that, you can see that we have this little expansion port here, right there. Now what I've done is I've actually wired this wire into one of the pins of the expansion port right there. I wired the pin into the expansion port, and what that's going to do is, like a keyboard and like a mouse, it's actually going to simulate a button press on the black box toolkit, it's, or sorry, on the SR box itself. So that's how we set up the hardware for this portion. Setting up the software is actually remarkably easy once you have all the hardware set up. So I'm just going to walk you through making a very simple response. Um, a very simple response test. I'm going to add keyboard, mouse, SR box, and Kronos to this test and show you how to switch between them very quickly as well. So what we're going to do is we're going to start with a blank experiment. We just use the blank template in E-Prime. Now since this isn't necessarily an experiment that we're going to be showing to participants, it's not going to have all of the like nice nuanced things like the welcome screen with a full list of instructions because I'm assuming the person making this test is going to be the same person that's going to be conducting the timing tests once they're actually run. So you already know how this script is going to work so a lot of the, the objects in here are going to be pretty bare just to let you know that these things are functioning correctly. So the first thing to do is open up my session proc and I'm going to add an intro slide here. Um, I'm just going to rename this uh, text display object to introduction. Now all this is going to do is this is just going to be me saying press space to begin the test. That way you know that the test from this point on should be relatively automatic unless something is going wrong. And I'm going to show you how to add some contingencies in here as well to make sure that the test is functioning correctly so you're not collecting some useless data. So I'm going to double click on my introduction and it's just going to be very simple instructions just press space make space capital space timing data. There we go. Just very simple instructions. Um, and I'll actually move this down just a little bit so you can see that without my head being in the way. There we go. So the only change we need to do then is we need to click on this properties page here, go on the duration input tab, which is where we control the timing of the object, and we change the duration to infinite. And of course we're going to add an in keyboard input mask, and the allowable will be space. Um, and data logging is, of course, going to be set to standard. Um, if some of these properties seem like I'm running through them a little quickly, I am. There's kind of a lot of material to cover today. Uh, if you'd like more in-depth explanation about some of these properties that I'm setting, why I'm setting them the way I'm setting, um, please take a look at some of our past live streams. We do a really good job of going more into depth about these things. But today's kind of all focused on the timing and less about the experiment design. So, you know, I'm going to kind of breeze through some of this stuff a little fast. All right, so I'm going to click Apply and OK to save these changes. There we go, and I'm going to X out of that. 
Now the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add a list object here. I'm still going to stick with the same e-prime structure because I do want my data file to look good at the end. I want it to look exactly, you know, I want it to look like all of my other e-prime files and I want to be able to see the response for each trial all in a single column in my data file. So I am going to set this up in the typical session and block structure. I'm just not necessarily going to do the trial structure for this particular round. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to rename this list object. This is just going to be called block list. I'm going to hit enter. Now what I want to do is I want a lot of data points for this. I actually want 200 data points per trial. Um, the reason I'm picking 200 is because if I hop over to Black Box Toolkit here, you're going to see that um, one of the limits of um, the number of pulses that Black Box Toolkit can send back to ePrime is 200. And that's just all set up on um, the graphical user front end, and I'll show you that real quickly here. So that pulse limit or that pulse limit of 200 is really going to dictate how many trials of data we can collect at once. Because if Black Box Toolkit can only send 200 pulses back to ePrime, those pulses are simulated button responses. So therefore, we can only collect 200 trials of data at once or in one run. So you know, if you're using any other materials and, and not using Black Box Toolkit, that might vary for you. But in this case, we're using Black Box Toolkit version two, latest version of the software, and um, it only collects up to 200. So um, ideally we want about a thousand data points for this just to make sure that it's consistent and make sure nothing really changes. So we'll have to run this test five times in order to get those thousand data points. So what I'm going to do in order to get those 200 runs is I'm going to make a procedure object here just called block or er, block rock. Hit enter. Um, it doesn't exist but I like to create it and then we'd make, like to make the default value for newly created levels. Of course I would. Now I'm just going to change my weight from 1 to 200 here. Um, if you really want and really want to go crazy with it, you can add multiple levels here and you can add 199 levels and have all 200 trials just showing up there, but it's not really necessary. You cover the same thing uh, with this weight of 200. And also keep in mind that we don't need to randomize any of them because there's really nothing we're changing about the list object here. So this is really the only edit that we need to make. So I'm going to double click on my block proc and I'm going to add just um, a basic fixation slide. This is just something prompting me that um, the time or the, the the trial that I'm most important or most interested in, basically the, the important part, the slide object that's going to be doing all my timing, is about to appear on the screen. This is just so that I have a visual cue of okay, that trial completed, we're going on to the next one. So I'm actually just going to call this one for the back of my block list here, or block rock. I'm just going to rename this one just to fixation. Double click on it, and this is literally just going to be a plus sign on the screen, just letting me know that this is the top of the procedure and that the last trial completed successfully. So I'll go back into my block rock, and I'm going to add a slide object. Now, the slide object is what's going to be handling all of the timing of my experiment. So this is what's going to, what I'm going to look at specifically when I check the reaction time values to see the timing of my event or of my objects. So I'm going to rename this one just to stimulus. Just give it a nice generic name, and you know it's in line with our general experiment design guidelines. So I'm going to double click on stimulus. Now the way that the timing for this is going to work is I'm going to be sending a signal from E Prime to Black Box Toolkit at the onset of the stimulus object. That lets Black Box Toolkit know, hey, the stimulus object is now on the screen. And it sends a pulse, and I'm going to be using task events, so it's going to time lock that pulse with the onset time of stimulus. So the second stimulus appears on the screen, or sorry, the millisecond stimulus appears on the screen, Black Box Toolkit is going to be getting a signal that says, hey, the stimulus is on the screen. Now, I've programmed Black Box Toolkit. If you look back at uh, when I showed you the screen there, I've programmed Black Box Toolkit have a hundred millisecond delay and then simulate a button press. So in that case it's going to be simulating a press to the Kronos device because Kronos is attached to the back of it and I'll show you that in a second. But what it's going to be doing is waiting that hundred milliseconds and then simulating a key press or simulating a Kronos, or a, a Kronos response. Any delay over a hundred milliseconds is going to be the delay in that response device because Black Box Toolkit, um, they've done a lot of testing to maintain millisecond or ensure millisecond accuracy on their end. 
So when they say 100 milliseconds has passed, you know 100 milliseconds has passed. So any delay that we see in the RT value or any RT value over 100 represents a delay in milliseconds in that device. And this just makes the data very easy for us to parse through because instead of having to look at exactly when the pulse was sent and then exactly when the response came in and then subtract those two things, all we're going to have to look at in this case is just the dot RT value for stimulus. That's what's going to tell us what our delay is and it's going to be really easy to take a look at that data then. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to add on this slide object, the first thing I'm going to do is just make it visual. I'm going to have some sort of visual cue on the screen and it's just going to say something like sending signal. Again, this isn't entirely necessary. I just like to see it to know that it's happening now. Now I'm going to actually start adding my task events into my experiment. Now the first thing I need to do in my experiment object here is I need to add a Kronos device. To add a Kronos device, click on that experiment object and then click on add and then add a Kronos. Now keep in mind, if you don't have a Kronos device but you do have a parallel port, you can accomplish this exact same thing. Uh, we're going to be doing digital output signals for the Kronos. You can also just add a parallel port here and just add or send standard parallel port signals as well. Um, and if you want, you can have something like this. This is just a little breakout board and you can connect this end into black box toolkit and just connect the standard end of your parallel port into the parallel port on your computer. That way you can achieve the exact same thing without a Kronos if you do have this parallel port. But since I have, you know, I don't have the option of a parallel port here, Kronos is going to be perfect for me. So I'm actually just going to add Kronos, but I'm going to keep parallel port on there just in case. Go ahead and click apply and OK here. And then I'm going to hop back into my properties page for the stimulus object. Now I'm going to go over to task events because this is where we're going to need to send our signals. And I'm going to add a signal to the dot onset time of stimulus. Now I had mentioned that this is when I want to send my signal uh, through EEPROM. I want it to be time locked with the onset so Blackbox Toolkit gets that signal the second this object appears on the screen with no delay. Because if there's any delay in getting the signal from EEPROM to Blackbox Toolkit, that's going to throw our timing data off. And that's why we don't use an inline object before it as well. Because if you use an inline object, there's going to be a delay relative to the dot onset delay of the stimulus object and that's going to throw your data off by the onset delay. So I don't want any of the onset delay to show up in my timing response data. I only want my timing response data, obviously. So I'm going to keep my dot onset time here and I'm going to choose a task. Now my task is of course going to be Kronos because that's the vehicle through which I'll be sending my signals. I'm going to change my action and my action is just going to be this digital out right, oops, sorry, it's LED color, digital out right integer. I'm going to keep my source at custom and I'm just going to be sending a standard pulse of 255. Um, if you're using a parallel port, this is similar to just setting all of the pins on the parallel port to high. It is, you know, the probably least um, elegant way, the least specific way to send signals. It's just saying, hey, we're just shooting out all of these signals, something's going to hit. And we'll change our data type to integer here, to match right integer. Now what I'm also going to do is I'm going to add one more stimulus dot onset time. I'm going to add a Kronos device, and I'm going to give it a delay of 10 milliseconds. And what we're going to do is essentially clear the port. Uh, digital outright integer. I'm going to change my custom to zero, which is the same as setting everything from high to low. That way we know that all the pins are reset before the next trial happens. And then I'm going to set my uh, data type to integer there. So now everything's all set to send my signals to Blackbox Toolkit. Now the next thing I want to do is I want to set E-Prime to listen for that response from Blackbox Toolkit. And it's just going to be doing that by sending a pulse to the Kronos' digital input on the um, I.O. expander. So I'm going to hop over to my duration input tab here. Now the one thing that I do want to change is this duration property. Now you can set the duration to whatever you want because technically we're going to be making this object terminate uh, whenever it receives a signal back from Blackbox Toolkit. So theoretically, the duration can be anything. But if you're doing this test at first, what I like to do is I like to actually set the duration to infinite here. What this allows you to do is it allows this object to stay on the screen until it receives a signal from Blackbox Toolkit. So if this object stays on the screen indefinitely, you know that something's wrong with the communication there. Uh, it might be a loose wire. It might be, you know, something might not be plugged in correctly. It could be a number of reasons. But if you keep this at infinite, it's a very fast and very easy way to determine, okay, something's wrong. I'm going to set my data logging to standard because I do need to collect data here. I am going to add a Kronos 
and I'm actually just going to keep Kronos set to any. If again, since we're just kind of doing just a general blast of you know any response that comes into Kronos through that digital input is going to be exactly what we need, and I'm just going to keep that as any. I'm going to click Apply and OK. And then all I'm going to do is just so I'm going to open up my session proc and I'm going to add one more um, text display object here. And I'm just going to call this one goodbye. There we go. It's just going to say thank you very much. And that's how we're going to end the experiment. So like I said, very simple, very basic experiment. That's why we're hitting a couple of them today. But I want to show you what the hardware setup for this is going to look like specifically then. So I'm going to have to hop over to my other camera quickly. Now what we were looking at there was we were actually looking at the Kronos device with the I.O. expander on the back. That was that little piece that was connected to it. Uh, and what it's doing is there's actually two ports in the back of Blackbox Toolkit that we're using. One of which is called Response Pad. Um, Blackbox Toolkit makes response pads. Uh, and we're actually just wiring Kronos with a wire very, very similar to this. Standard wire. Um, from the Kronos I.O. expander into the response pad portion of Blackbox Toolkit. Now what that's doing is it's simulating a button press of one in Blackbox Toolkit. So the signal that we're sending at the dot onset time of the stimulus object is going to appear to Blackbox Toolkit like I'm pressing a button on its response pad. Then, since I have the, hard, the software set up to wait a or 100 milliseconds, it's going to wait that 100 milliseconds, and then if you looked on the left, I actually, there's just a standard parallel port, I have one wire going into the ground of the parallel port, and I have one wire going into just one of the data pins, and it's going to send a signal out, it's just called TTL1 in Blackbox Toolkit, it's going to be sending that signal out from Blackbox Toolkit back into the Kronos device, and that's what's going to be what we're going to be judging our timing on. So we're going to be determining the timing based on how long it took for that signal to be logged in ePrime's data file, and that's going to tell us the delay in ePrime. So I've already run this data before. I actually ran it earlier this week, so I'm going to show you guys what that data file is going to look like then. And I just have that on my desktop here. ePrime timing, I have device timing results, and the first one we're going to take a look at is Kronos. So as you can see, I have quite a lot of data here, but one of the most important ones is just my RT time, because I have everything set up to just look at the RT value. So I'm going to remove all of these from my data file, and I'm just going to filter it by the .RT. And you see I have stimulus RT here, so I'm just going to add it, and I also have my stimulus.chronos.rt. These things are going to be identical. So I'm going to click OK. So as you can see now, what I have on my screen is I have these 100, uh, 100 ones and these 100s. What this 100 represents is the time between when ePrime sent the signal to Blackbox Toolkit and it waited that 100 milliseconds, and then everything over 100 milliseconds is going to represent the time at or the delay in the device. So if I look at my RT values here, you can see that generally speaking, they're between 100 and 101. And I can do some descriptive statistics on these, but it's pretty easy to see the kind of data that I'm getting right now. So any uh, delay of 100 milliseconds just means that if there was a delay, then it was sub-millisecond. And a delay of 1 millisecond just means it took 1 millisecond for E-prime to register the response happened on Kronos. So this is a good way to kind of test your timing. And this is one of the reasons, or one of the most important reasons, that whenever we claim that the Kronos device is millisecond accurate, that we actually have data to back this up. This is the data, and then this is how you can collect that data at home as well. Because despite it being USB, we're still getting these almost excellent response times. So now that we have that set up, I'm going to not save changes to that. Now that we have that set up for Kronos, I'm going to show you how to set it up to easily change between other response devices. Because if you saw, I have a mouse, I have a keyboard, I have um, an SR box over here, and I want to test the timing on all of them. So I'm going to go into my stimulus object here, and I'm just going to add some more input masks. So now I'm going to add a keyboard, 
and it's just going to be the same properties as my chronos. I'm going to keep allowable set to any. If you remember, I have my keyboard device wired to press an X key, so theoretically I could do this, and it'll be the same thing. But just as some basic troubleshooting, it's always a good idea just to set the allowable to any at first. That way, any response that comes into the keyboard um, through that pulse or that 5 volt signal that's getting sent in is going to simulate a key press there. Uh, and I will add a mouse device, and then I'll have to add an SR box as well. And I can just do that, and I cl click through that kind of fast to add an SR box. You double click on the experiment object up here, click on devices, click add, and then you click SR box. And then, of course, you'll have to change the port here. So um, the port to match the COM number because it is serial port communication. Um, I, of course, don't have a serial port on this computer, so it doesn't really matter what I set it to. But if you have a serial port or a serial USB cable, it's going to show up under your device manager through the comms and LPT section. And you just put the number that's next to the word COM into this port property. Pretty easy. There we go. So then we have Kronos parallel port, SR box, mouse, and we just make sure that we have all of these. So basically what this is doing now is this is telling E-Prime, hey, any signal that comes in through any of these devices is what I'm uh, is what I'm timing testing. If you want to be specific and you want to say I'm only accepting keyboard responses at this point, all you do is just uncheck the um, input mask that you want and select the one that, or the input mask that you don't want and make sure the one that you do want is selected. And then click apply and OK and in this case it's set up to run keyboard timing tests. Now, for the keyboard timing tests, or for any of these other peripheral devices, the setup is going to look very, very similar, but just a little different. What I would do, and I'll just demonstrate quickly with this little keyboard that I have here. All I would do is I would take my keyboard, and I would plug one end of it, obviously, into my computer, because this is the keyboard that E-Prime is going to be using to simulate that response. I would just plug that into the computer. I would then take my other end of this, and I would put it into my black box toolkit. Now, I would keep the pulse generator the exact same, so Chronos still has to be there in order to send that simulated button response to Blackbox Toolkit. So you're still sending that signal through uh, to Blackbox Toolkit using this stimulus onset time task events. It's still going to use Chronos. That's still completely okay. But what I'm going to do then, instead of having that TTL out go straight to Chronos, it's actually going to go straight to here. Um, now, since this is kind of a little tiny frayed wire, I would of course use a gator clip. I would attach a gator clip to one end of this and then attach um, a, a wire going into black box toolkit with a gator clip on the other end. Um, so that would just be the easiest way to do something like that. But that's how we do the keyboard timing test when we do E prime, or when we timing test E prime. I mean, and of course, we have a lot of timing tests. These don't represent the entirety of them, but that's one of the timing tests that we actually do here. And it's relatively simple for you guys to replicate at home. And I'll just show you the data quickly that we got from doing these timing tests earlier this week as well. So here's some keyboard data that we collected earlier using this exact paradigm that I had made. A few modifications just to make data analysis a little easier for us, but this exact setup. RT. So if you remember, our Kronos was all around 100 milliseconds. It's around 100 to 117, or 100 and 101 milliseconds. Sorry about that. If you look here, we get a little bit larger delays. Now these are just called, I mean these are just the, the delays in pressing keyboard buttons. So you see we have some 19 milliseconds, 14 and 17. So I mean at least they're pretty consistent. There's 120 there. So these aren't, you know, the worst reaction times in the world. I mean they're a couple milliseconds off. So just know that this data or these delays are going to be packed into your RT time. So any delays that you have with your keyboard, you you know, need to know that even if the participant pressed the button as quickly as possible, because the keyboard itself introduces timing delays and timing variables, your reaction time is going to be increased by 19 milliseconds, 13 milliseconds, just to account for how long it takes the keyboard to receive a signal that it's been pressed. Now, keep in mind keyboards, some keyboards, or most you know, market keyboards aren't actually made to be millisecond accurate. They're not made for scientific research like we need them to be. They're made for word processing and they're made for gaming and things like that. And you know, if you're typing a word document, you're not going to notice a delay of 13 milliseconds between pressing a button and having a word appear or a letter appear in a Microsoft Word document. Um, if you're playing a video game, you're not going to you know notice a 13 millisecond delay between when you tell your character to move and when it actually moves. Um, but for psychological research, that's pretty important, and it is important to understand the timing of the devices that you're introducing into, into your, um, your data collection environment. 
Similarly, we'll go ahead and take a look at a mouse. T. There we go. And these look pretty similar. We have about 113 milliseconds here, 119. We have 110, 118. Mice um, have notoriously high and notoriously variable um, timing properties like this. Um, this is actually pretty good for a mouse object, but just know that pressing a mouse button introduces delay as well. And then we have our SR box. And this is just straight through the serial port through a serial the USB cable. Whoops, wrong button. And we'll just go ahead and filter these. And we have a pretty consistent 104 milliseconds to 102 to 3 milliseconds. So these are about anywhere between a 2 to 4 millisecond delay between when I press a button on the SR box and when it actually appears in E Prime, which honestly isn't too bad. So that's how you would test all of the timing on your actual um, on your actual response devices. So if you want to figure out what types of timing these devices have, if you want to see how millisecond accurate they are, just know that E-Prime is capable of capturing all of that information, and that's why we can make these claims that Kronos is millisecond accurate, E-Prime is millisecond accurate, those kinds of things, is because we verify it with this third-party software. Um, but there are a couple other parts to your experiment than just the response devices, and we're going to talk about those now. So the other part I'm going to talk about, or the next part, is going to be sound. Now, I'm not actually going to build the sound experiment in front of you. It's pretty simple. I'm just going to demonstrate one of the ones that we use. Um, and this one just called Kronos Sound, Sound Latency. Now, sound latency is important when you're playing audio to participants because the what we call sound onset latency is the difference between when E-Prime requests that a sound is played through a computer and when the sound is actually heard through the speakers. Now, there are a lot of steps involved in internal or in computer software that kind of go through, you know, okay, it has to request it from the sound card, the sound card has to play it, buffering needs to occur, those types of things. And that does introduce considerable delays when you're running your experiments. And this is a way to test whether or what those delays are and how high they are. Um, and in this case, we are gonna need um, the black box toolkit again. And unlike last time where we were doing all of our um, response capturing in E-Prime, we're actually gonna be doing it all in black box toolkit now but the setup is going to be almost identical. And if you look here, we have a couple of objects on this uh, on this trial prop. That's a little more than you need. We have um, an adjust chronos in line, and that's just going to be adjusting you know, what the volume levels are. And if you do see this and you do want um, an experiment similar to this, please feel free to email us at support. We are happy to give you something like this to test out your sound latency as well. But for now, this is just the test that we use, and I'm going to be fixating on a couple of very important parts of it. But um, if I go into my stimulus object here, this is going to be the most important part for my, my timing here. I'm going to take a look at the properties page, and if I go into my task events, this is going to look extremely, extremely similar. Now if you look here, we're actually just sending um, a custom signal, and if I hop into my trial list here, you can see what that custom signal is. There we go, so that's that sound file that we're sending here. Um, that's a fixation sound. This is that white noise sound file. In this case, we are just testing with white noise. We don't necessarily need to be um, testing with anything else. And then this uh, LSB0, LSB1, and LSB2, these properties that you saw there, these are just the pins on the Kronos device itself that we're setting from low to high, um, just like sending the 255 in the last experiment. So if I go into my stimulus here, you can see that what we're doing is we're actually sending a signal here at the very onset of it. So we're going to be sending a signal from E-Prime to Blackbox Toolkit through Kronos, literally identical to the response device test. But what we're going to be doing differently is you see the duration here is just set to 50 milliseconds and nothing is actually set um, in the input mask here. That's because, again, the data collection part of it is going to be handled entirely by Blackbox Toolkit. We actually have one of these cables here, just a very simple, very basic audio cable. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to just run this audio cable, once it's a little untangled, there we go. I'm just going to run this audio cable uh, into E-Prime, and E-Prime is actually going to use it to play the sound that I have here. This is just that sound out, and that file name is just that white noise that we're playing. I'm going to plug this into E-Prime, and I'm going to plug the other end into the front of the black box toolkit. Let me show you very quickly where that is.
Now the front of the black box toolkit has that mic one port. I'm actually just going to be plugging this into the mic one port so the sound is going to be playing out of E prime and into black box toolkit. Now I just have black box toolkit set up to A receive the signal and I have it set up to receive the audio from mic one. What that's going to do is that's going to get me the difference between when this, when this object appeared on the screen and when the sound started playing. That difference is going to represent your sound onset latency. And of course your sound onset latency is going to vary, be very, or is going to vary by a lot of different factors. It's going to vary by your API. So if you go into your experiment object, click on devices, and click on sound, which one of these APIs are you using to play sound? That's going to be a huge uh, player in your um, in your sound onset latency and how long it takes that sound to actually begin playing when it's requested uh, E-Prime to play. Um, and it's also going to depend on the hardware that you're using to play the sound. Um, in this case we're just using this audio cable, but your speakers introduce delay. Uh, and then it also depends on um, the sound card in the computer itself and what it's capable of doing. So there's a lot of factors that go into that. And um, again, it's just a very basic experiment just to show you exactly what that's going to be. Now, um, since I don't have Black Box Toolkit loaded onto this computer, it's on that other one over there, I don't have any data to show you for that, but if you would like our timing data, we have a lot of that posted on our product service and support site. If you just go to support.pstnet.com, that'll show you, you know, we have plenty of our timing data, or actually all of our timing data for um, all of our audio devices, just all available on ePrime. We're all available to take a look at, so definitely take a look at our timing data for our sound files if you'd like to know a little bit more about this. Now the last thing I'm going to talk about today is I'm going to talk about the display timing. Now display timing is going to represent how quickly you can draw or your computer is capable of drawing to the screen. Now keep in mind EPRON tries to do a lot of this work for you. I'll show you a data file here very quickly. Um, we'll do this, we'll do this Chronos device once we already looked at this. Keep in mind, E-Prime already tries to do a lot of this work for you, so whenever I was running this experiment, you can see here that I was running with this refresh rate as logged by E-Prime. Um, I was running at about 75 hertz, which if you just go online, there's very simple hertz to millisecond conversion, and it lets you know that, hey, you've been drawing to the screen this fast, or this is how quickly devices draw to the screen. But the important thing to keep in mind about drawing to the screen is, is I'm getting the 75 hertz. Um, the easiest one for me to convert in my head is 60 hertz. If I draw, uh, if my refresh rate was 60 hertz, that means my screen would be updating once every 16.66666 repeated milliseconds. Um, what that means is that the entire screen is drawn every 16.66666 milliseconds. But if you notice, notice in any of our E-Prime um, e -prime experiments, if you move something around to the screen, so for example, if I move this, um, this text display object, for example, to the screen. And if I set the, um, the position, the x and y position here, to 0, 0, what it does is it actually jumps to the top left-hand corner of the screen. Now, the reason the top left-hand corner of the screen is 0, 0 and the bottom right-hand corner of the screen is the full resolution of the screen. So in this case, I'm running at 640 by 480. So if I were to set the properties of the x and y coordinates here to Sorry about that. If I were to set them to 640 by 480, I'm going to see it jump to the bottom right hand corner of the screen there, and it even went off a little bit. Um, now the reason that it's doing that, or the reason that the top left hand corner is 00 and the bottom right hand corner is the resolution of the screen, is because that's how screens draw, and that's the order in which everything is drawn to the screen. So the top left hand corner is actually drawn first, there we go is actually drawn first, and the bottom right-hand corner is the last thing to be drawn, this, drawn on the screen. That's really important to know whenever you're drawing anything to the screen, and I'm going to open up this experiment very quickly to show you this. So we have this, um, this test here, it's called Kronos Rise Fall Mod, um, and what it's doing is it's actually testing the response time of different things being drawn to the screen, and how long it takes them to be drawn to the screen. And this is something that's really easy to make, um, and uh, I'll walk you through the entirety of it. Because if you look here, it's not overly complex at all. So if you look here, um, you know the most complex thing are obviously these inline objects. And what it's doing here is it's actually doing something called photosensor gain. Um, now, when you purchase Kronos, you get this device here. This device is Kronos's photosensor. 
what it does is it lets you know obviously how fast your screen is able to draw and it's actually extremely important in doing analysis for this so what we're doing here and I'll take a look at my stimulus object this is what's going to be handling all of our timing and you'll notice the timing is going to be different where we uh, or depending on where we put the object on the screen so if we open up the properties of our stimulus object this is going to look very very similar to the response object or the response timing tests and to the sound timing tests um, we don't have any task events because we don't actually need task events we're not actually doing any black box toolkit testing in this in this case in this case all of the testing is actually going to be handled by Chronos itself keep in mind black box toolkit does have um, a refresh detector um, you can check our timing as far as delays are concerned entirely through black box toolkit um, but we've done a lot of timing benchmarks on the Chronos itself so we know that it can't handle these kinds of things um, if you'd like more information on how we were able to do that please feel free to send us an email we're always happy to explain these things because I mean honestly this is our passion so it's really cool and really fun for us to talk about these kinds of things so all we're doing here is we're actually just having Chronos wait for a response of C and of course the correct response of C is the only response um, and we have a duration of 100 milliseconds. We don't actually ever expect it to get to 100 milliseconds because the allowable and the correct are set to C. So theoretically, you can set this to infinite as well if you really want, but 100 milliseconds is honestly the high end of how long this object should be on the screen. And the reason that we're setting the allowable here to C, if you notice the Kronos only has five keys in the front, is if you take a look at the Kronos device itself and the devices tab, you're gonna wanna go over to this um, here, this responses tab. This responses tab um, are basically what we call in Kronos pseudo buttons. They are um, different hardware aspects of the Kronos that you can turn into buttons whenever you reference them in, in E prime experiments. So obviously you have the one key, two, three, four, five. Uh, you have all of your normal keys on the top of Kronos, but everything else has an associated button. If you have a voice key connected, that acts as a six and will respond as a six. Um, but the one we're looking at today specifically is this photo sensor. Whenever you take this photo sensor and you plug it into your Kronos, whatever you hook this up to, it's actually going to log as a response of C through Kronos. That's why in our properties here, on the stimulus object, we're actually looking for an allowable of C. So we're waiting for a response from the photo sensor. I'm just going to put that back there. Now the important thing to keep in mind is that this fixation object is completely black because this is how we're gonna get the difference in the rise time and the fall time of, um, and see the feedback back here, um, is just going to be the stimulus rest and the stimulus start RT. But um, this is how we're gonna get that uh, photo sensor to trigger. Because what's gonna happen is if you have this set to black here, what it's going to do um, is it's actually going to say, okay, the screen is now black, when the stimulus appears, it's going to show that it is turning from black to white, and that's what's going to be triggering that photo sensor. And that's how you're going to get the timing for your monitor, um, especially um, depending on where you put it on the screen. And I'll show you exactly what I mean when we take a look at some of the data files. So we go into the E-Prime timing, go to the display timing here. I'm going to open up this Kronos Rise Fall mod, which is just the data that we got from this. And I'm just going to take a look at my stimulus RT here. So I'm going to um, go to arrange columns. I'm going to remove all of these and just take a look at that RT value. Oops. I think I removed all of them again. There we go. So we have this stimulus.rt. Now at first these look like very, very small numbers. Um, we have four milliseconds, three milliseconds, five milliseconds. That's because the first couple of runs that we've done, we had the photo sensor in the upper left-hand corner, and that's the very first thing to draw to the screen. So that's expected. We expect it to draw faster to the top of the screen than it does the middle of the screen than the bottom of the screen. And you can see that really, really clearly in our data here. So we have that four milliseconds, uh, as low as two there. We scroll down a little bit more. Now we're starting to see nines, we're starting to see tens. This means the photo sensor was about in the center of the screen. This is how long it takes for your monitor to draw things because it goes from the top left corner or zero, zero to the bottom right corner. And then if we go all the way down to the bottom here, we're gonna see that we're at 15 and 16 milliseconds, which means it should be running at about a 60 Hertz refresh rate. And if we add all these back, it looks like we're exactly correct. So it looks like things are running exactly the way they need to be. 
So this is looking pretty good. So this is how the data is going to look like if you actually take a look at or if you actually set up your experiment in this way. Now the reason that this is important, it isn't just to be, oh, mill, you know, E-prime is millisecond accurate and it's not just for us gloating, it's actually important in your experiment design as well. Because if you take a look at this data file here, um, this Kronos rise fall, you can see that in the bottom right hand corner of your screen, it took 16 milliseconds for E-prime to go from the fixation screen, which is all black, to the stimulus screen, which is all white which means this is how long E prime draws to the screen or how long it's going to take. If you're ever introducing onset delays in E prime or you're ever getting any delays in E prime, it's important to keep in mind that E prime does need this amount of time to draw to the screen. This isn't a factor of E prime, it's just a factor of how monitors work. Um, monitors in general need to take time in order to change what they're showing. And in this case, this particular monitor that we did these timing tests on took about 16 milliseconds to completely draw the entire image to the screen. So if you're ever getting onset delays and you see onset delays of 16 milliseconds, maybe 17 milliseconds, something like that, know that this is where those delays are coming from. Those delays are coming from your literally just images or your images or your object appearing on the screen. It's not E prime halting the process, it's not E prime slowing itself down. It's just computers doing what computers do. I mean, if we lived in a perfect world and you know where there weren't these hardware restrictions, then everything would show up with exactly zero millisecond onset delay, and this 16 millisecond delay would be zero milliseconds. But I mean, we call it the hardware bottleneck internally. Um, it's just the amount of time that it takes for the hardware to do what it's supposed to do. So the reason that's important for experiment design, then kind of bringing that back to um, applying this stuff to your experiments is if you have an object that you would like to present with the millisecond with you know the best kind of millisecond accuracy you'd like to show up with you know close to zero onset delay we recommend setting the refresh or the duration of an object so just the duration property right here um, to be divisible by the refresh rate of your screen so if I take a look here we'll see that the maximum amount of time that we get for stimulus RT to draw is 16 so I'm going to make sure that my stimulus object is divisible by 16 because that's how long it's going to take everything to draw to my screen so I want to make sure that I'm optimizing everything so I don't have these long onset delays and I mean you know 16 milliseconds here and there doesn't matter but eventually those things are going to start to compound and compound and compound and then your experiment's going to be off, especially if you're doing something like an fMRI experiment when you need to time your experiment with the start and stop of a scanner. So that's why we recommend um, changing the duration of your object to match your screen refresh rate, and that's exactly how we talk about testing it. So I mean, you can obviously use whatever you want to test those types of things, but we use Kronos just because, I mean, it's a device we made, it's very helpful, and we have these timing properties of it already. So, you know, we already know that it's, you know, millisecond accurate. We've tested this rigorously to make sure that what we're saying on Kronos is what Black Box Toolkit is also saying. Um, and we actually do tests where we have Kronos's photo sensor and Black Box Toolkit's refresh detector hooked up to the exact same computer, and we make sure that they're getting the exact same numbers. So, you know, we have tested Kronos a lot. That's why we're kind of relying on it pretty heavily in this webinar to be doing a lot of the heavy lifting as far as sending our signals are concerned, determining the refresh rate of these, um, you know, determine the refresh rate of our computer, those types of things. So, you know, it is just a very easy way to do this in your experiment. So, um, yeah, so that's basically all the, um, all the material that I had for today. Um, that's, you know, how to set up a simple response um, timing experiment, how to set up sound timing experiments, and how to set up um, display timing experiments. If you would like any of these, because um, today I did kind of open a couple of them and not necessarily walk you through going over them. Um, they're very similar to the one we did walk through today, though, so the little tweaks that we made should be pretty easy to pretty easy to make on your own. But if you would like any of these, please feel free to go to support.pstnet.com and let us know. We're always happy to give out any of these experiments that you guys would like or make one that would suit your environment as well or help you with making one. Um, yeah, so feel free to ask us for those kinds of things. Um, if you have any more information, please feel free to email us. I'd be happy to send or point you to our timing data that we have collected, because we collect these data or this kind of data on all sorts of operating systems, because we make sure that that's not a factor. We collect it under um, a lot of different run environments. Uh, we collect a lot of, you know, we do a lot of timing tests to make sure that we can say we're millisecond accurate like we do. But if you'd like to see any of it, please let us know. Um, if you have ideas for future videos, also let us know. Next week's video is going to be a lot of fun too. 
Uh, it's also about millisecond accuracy in E-Prime, but instead of making sure that the hardware that you're using is millisecond accurate like today's was, it's actually making sure that their, um, the millisecond accuracy in your experiment is set up correctly. So I've been in tech support for upwards of five years now, going on six years. Um, I'm going to show you guys the types of things that I always see in experiments, and I always have to tweak to make them as millisecond accurate as possible, just to make sure that you have the best timing on your experiment. And I'll talk about a couple of different scenarios, and the good and the bad, and the benefits of each one of those things as well. But if you guys have recommendations for other uh, live streams as well, please feel free to leave us a comment, send us an email. I'm happy to um, schedule these things around your guys' needs. Um, as always, please feel free to like and subscribe. This lets us keep doing what we're doing. And thank you guys very much for attending the live stream today.